right, folks. Um, I would like to introduce you here today, Karamagov, as uh, journalist Jack and Shaw, um, for this discussion with the author and academic Dennis O'Hearn from the United States. Dennis lived in Belfast for 30 odd years um, from the 70s, and he is now uh, the Dean of Liberal Arts in the University of El Paso. And for us, the most notable um, opus uh, from Dennis, it has to be said, is this book, the book on Bobby Sands, Nothing But An Unfinished Song, which uh, Dennis is going to talk to us about today, and then we will have a discussion. Garmagov, go ahead, Dennis. Okay, thanks very much, Shana. Uh, I, I just want to, first of all, thanks, thank the failure for inviting me to do this talk today. And uh, I'd like to thank you, Shana. Uh, first of all, I think probably you were the first person that I contacted when I was trying to get, get people to talk to, uh, to interview uh, for the book. And I kind of remember seeing you down in the uh, Sinn Féin Center. And I think I asked you if you'd be willing to do some interviews. And you said, yeah, um, would five or 10 minutes do? <laughs> <laughs> And then a couple of weeks later, we began doing interviews. I think we did maybe three. And, and at the end, I had hours of, of, of taped interviews. Okay. And it really was an important opening. you know. And then, of course, people like Beck and others followed, uh, who made this a, a project that really came to fruition. And you know, one of the main things that I was trying to do in the book was to give voice to the prisoners and voice to, to those who were in struggle with Bobby. And uh, Lawrence McGillan, in one of his reviews of the book wrote the following. He said, the strength of the book is that O'Hearn does not attempt to tell what he thinks happened behind prison walls as other academics have, or to interpret events within his own ideological paradigm. Instead, he facilitates others, friends, associates, comrades of Bobby to tell of the person they knew and allows that person to become alive and vibrant on every page. And I think that's about the best, um, you know, plot it that I could have got for this book because that's exactly what I was trying to do. And what I'm going to talk to talk about today is is kind of what's happened since the book was published and the impact that not just Bobby, but the prisoners and the prisoners in struggle have had on movements around the world. So we'll be taking a little bit of a tour uh, okay. to some of the prisons in the US. Uh, we will look at, at uh, prison struggles in the Basque country. Uh, and in Turkey and among Kurds as well. And, and also the impact that Bobby is having with the uh, YPG uh, in Rojava and the, the, the attempt to build a new regime, which is really an autonomous and a new kind of way of, of living in the autonomous region of Rojava in Northern Syria. So what, what Lawrence says is exactly what I was trying to do. And you know, I'm going to say a lot about what the impact the book has had on social justice, but what it really means is the impact that people like Bobby, but also like you, Shana, and others who were involved in that struggle uh, have had on, on the example that of building a community in struggle inside the prison. And it's not just the hunger strike, but all of the, the ways in which, you know, in this really severe condition, uh, prisoners were able to to build a community. And, and that's been a real example, I think, to people around the world. The other person I, I want to thank before I get started, of course, is Bill Rolston. Uh, Bill not only invited me to do the talk here today and, and, and you as well, Shana, to be involved in the discussion, but Bill in his role with Beyond the Pale Publications, uh, of course, was, was key in uh, publishing a young people's version of this book that I wrote together with Lawrence McKeown. And then that was also translated into Italian. And uh, I think that had a, a big impact as well. It came out in English and Irish and, you know, the ability to kind of do a side-by-side -side translation uh, for young people to look at Bobby's life, I think has been very important. So I just want to tell some stories for a little while uh, about the impact of the Irish prison struggle of the late 70s and leading to the hunger strikes of 1980 and 1981, and the huge impact that it's had on struggles around the world. And I'll start in the United States, uh, in the state of Ohio. Right after the book came out, I got a letter from uh, a man called Bomani Shakur. And Bomani asked, you know, if we could start corresponding. 
Uh, he was in uh, Supermax prison. Supermax uh, is like super maximum security, which means people are held in a cell about the size of a car park, a parking space, uh, 24 hours a day, or maybe 23 hours, and then they get one hour of outside exercise. But all of that time, they are uh, completely alone, uh, never able to have any interaction with other people, except as, as you'd be familiar with, shouting out the door. Yeah. Uh, but they never touch each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bomani and, and four others had been involved in the Lucasville uprising in uh, Lucasville prison in, in uh, 1992. And it was the longest prison uprising in US history. And for their role in that, they were all given death sentences. And this uh, Ohio Supermax prison or Ohio State Penitentiary was actually built for these five men who were given the death sentence and put in there. And so from the time that it opened in 1995, and really from the time of the uprising in 1992, uh, these five men and then hundreds of men after them were kept in long-term solitary isolation where they were never able to touch another person, uh, you know, and, and never got out of their cells except for this one hour of so-called outside exercise, which actually was in a cage with a kind of great above them and a, a guard sitting in a chair uh, watching every move that, that they did. So it was a, a completely, um, you know, severe existence. And I think a lot of people don't realize it, but around the US at that time, 90,000 men, it's been estimated, were held in that kind of prison condition where they never got to get out of their cell. They never got to touch other, other people. Uh, you know, even in, in the descriptions of what was happening in the H blocks, we know that, you know, you were able at least to get out on Sundays to go to mass mm -hmm. and all that kind of thing. They yeah. never even got that. Uh, so it, it, it's a really severe existence. Some folks, uh, one notable case was the Angola Three, who were Black Panthers, had been in this form of isolation in Angola prison in Louisiana for 40 years. So I met Bomani, <clears throat> who's also, uh, his original name is Keith Lamar. And I, when, whenever I moved to the US and I began teaching at the State University of New York, I would drive six hours or so to meet Bomani at least once a month, which was all we were allowed to, to have visits. And I'll just share here uh, the screen so that we can uh, see a little bit about what I'm talking about. Uh, there's there's the original copy of the book. Yeah. Um, no, I'm trying to get it to change. This is this is Ohio State Prison, uh, Ohio State Penitentiary, and these are built all over the United States. These supermax penitentiaries, and they have this kind of thing. And basically, people are kept. Uh, the prisoners are kept in these uh, small cells uh, for you know all all of the day. Um, some of them have very tiny windows. These have very tiny windows. I'll talk a little bit about Pelican Bay in California in a minute. Uh, Pelican Bay, they have no windows at all. And they're basically kept in a cave, essentially. And we'll see what that's like. So when I went to visit Bomani, beginning in about 2007, this was the situation uh, that our visits were. We had uh, security glass between us. And this was the closest that Bomani got to uh, interpersonal communication or you know, some kind of human uh, interaction were these visits that we had. And because I was coming from out of state, we, we were able to have five hour visits, which was, was very nice. I was really worried when I first went to see him, uh, what would we talk about for five hours? But I very quickly found out that five hours just really sped by when you're with someone uh, like Bomani, who, who basically has no chance to have real positive interaction. The other thing about him, he's, a, he's an incredible um, sort of organic intellectual who has, is able to write uh, amazing stuff, you know, very much in a way like Bobby was, was able to kind of just naturally come into the ability to, to write and to uh, communicate. Um, so I had talks with Bomani uh, I then got to know the guy on the right, who's uh, Jason Robb. And these are three people who then became involved in uh, 
in a prison struggle, which very much followed on, on the example of the Irish prisoners. But let me go back and tell you what happened. Uh, we, we would have these discussions and this happened over a period of a couple of years. And uh, Bomani said to me one day, he said, why, do, why don't we have a class? And why don't we invite your students to begin to interact with people who are in jail in prison conditions like me? And we did that. Um, we got 10 prisoners from around the country and including two guys from Pelican Bay in California. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And what we did is they all read the same stuff. It was all prison literature by experts, so-called experts. And, uh, but it kind of turned things on the head because the students then began asking questions about what they were reading and what the prisoners were reading at the same time. And they would, the prisoners then become the experts because they would say, you know, so-and-so says such and such, but you know, that's not really what it's like here in prison. That's not really what's going on. But you know, as we were doing that, one of the books that we read was the book about, uh, about Bobby and about the Irish prison struggle. And as we were doing that, I mean, uh, un unbeknownst to me, Bomani had other ideas and he was beginning to form other things and especially coming out of his understanding and recognition of some of the creative ways that the Irish prisoners um, reacted to some of the same conditions that they were facing. Uh, so, you know, they were, they were only able to communicate out the doors. They were only able to uh, organize in a kind of a roundabout way, but they begin to do so. And uh, in 2009 and then go, going forward to 2011, uh, these three prisoners begin to organize a, a hunger strike. And um, they, um, the, the guy on the left, uh, Hassan, uh, was kind of the, the reason that the original prison uprising I talked about in Lucasville happened. He's, he's a Muslim. Sunni Muslim and Imam, and they were being forced to inject uh, TB tests that, that had alcohol in them. And of course that was against their religion. Now, a white guy, a black guy and a Muslim aren't meant to be friends, but they came together in these conditions and, and went into solidarity and, and rose up against a situation where the Muslim was, was being forced by the prison administration to do something that was against his religion. And these three, and uh, along with a couple more who were involved in that uprising, have been closest friends, and particularly Bomani and Jason, the white guy and the black guy. Jason is said to be in the Aryan Brotherhood, so you know he's not meant to be friendly with an African American from Cleveland, but they're best friends, and you know it's it's the recognition that the solidarity of having you know a joint enemy of the of you know, the prison uh, authorities and so on that's brought them together. So they organized a, a hunger strike um, coming out of that class and coming out really of reading about what happened uh, in, in, um, in Ireland. Uh, during 2010, Bomani confided in me that they were gonna do the strike and then they organized it in January, 2011. Uh, they went on hunger strike. They had five demands. They organized it very much in the pattern of what, what happened in, in 1981 uh, in Ireland. And they organized support on the outside. So it took a while. They, they got that you know, sense from a lot of the stuff they read about what was going on uh, with the blanket men. And in less than two weeks, they won all of their five demands. And those five demands included the right to actually meet with people to have what they called semi-contact visits. Uh, that was one of the main demands. So this is the first time uh, this picture in from 1993 until 2011, uh, that's 18 years. The first time that Bomani was actually able to touch his friends and to break bread with them and, and so on. And so, you know, coming out of, of what happened in, in the Irish prison struggle and the lessons that they learned from that, uh, they began to win their rights. And, you know, you can see the difference between that mm -hmm. and that and the joy on his face. Uh, soon we were able to have full contact visits and here we are, he's chained to a chair 
but you know we're able to actually sit and and you know be with each other and just act like normal human beings would uh, in in our interactions. And this is a picture that he sent me uh, after they won these full contact uh, visits, where he's with his niece and his nephew, who he had met many times behind that security glass. This is the first time that he was able to meet them and hug them and pick them up, as you see, and you can see the joy on his face. On the back of the picture, happiest day of my life, love, Bomani. Uh, and, you know, that's something personal, which happened to, to Bomani, and he was able to, you know, get lessons from what happened in the uh, Irish hunger strike and the Irish struggle that led him to have the confidence to, you know, to, to do those things and then to win uh, his rights. And he won it not only for him, but for all of the, the other prisoners that were being kept in, in long-term solitary confinement in that prison. But then the word went around throughout the United States. Oh, by the way, here's a, here we are on one visit on, on Bobby Sands' 60th birthday. And uh, Jason is an artist. So he, you know, uh, used some crayons that, that we had for the kids that are visiting the visiting room. And we had a little bit of a birthday party for Bobby on his 60th birthday. And you know that means a lot for them. There's Bomani in the back uh, mm -hmm. celebrating his, his birthday along with the others. Um, so let's move to Pelican Bay <clears throat> in California, which is probably the most notorious of these supermax prisons. And in Pelican Bay, there's a place called the Short Corridor. Again, no isolation, again, total isolation. And here there's no windows even in the cells. So they're clearly a, a cage. And in this prison class that we had, uh, there were two prisoners, Todd Ashker and Don Danny Troxell, again, who are purported to be members of the Aryan Brotherhood, although, although they, they deny it. Um, and they're in this, this, this little part of the short corridor. These are the cells that they live in. Again, 23 hours a day, um, they're in these cells. Uh, one hour of exercise, but the hour of exercises of so-called outside exercises in a concrete bunker. Here's their cell. It's a bed and it becomes a desk during the day. Uh, so this is Todd's cell and he moves his uh, bed on the floor and you know uses then his, his bed as a desk. But they look through this grating, you can see it here. It's like a real crazy existence where this is what they see, that's their only vision. Uh, outside of the cell is through the through this perforated metal grill that's on the front of the cell. And a lot of the lessons, you know, of, of that place are, you know, some of the same things that you'd be familiar with. Again, only being able to communicate by shouting out the out the door, shouting through the pipes, uh, you know, using lawyers who are the only ones that they can actually communicate with physically. Again, they can only communicate behind safety glass. So I went to visit Todd uh, in Pelican Bay and, and you know, our visit was just totally talking through a phone like you see in the movies, but that's all we were able to do. And again, you know, once they started um, this class and they started discussing things, uh, things begin to change. And just a little bit of background, the people in this short corridor, as they call it, uh, were thrown there in a way which, which will again remind you of some things about the, about the H-blocks because they decided, the prison authorities decided, let's take all the leaders and throw them, throw them together. Uh, and, and in that way, we can get them you know, out, of, out of the way of trouble. They won't do anything and they'll probably fight each other because they were, they were whites uh, from the Aryan Brotherhood. Uh, they were Latinos from the Mexican Mafia and La Nuestra Familia, which are prison organizations or gangs, as they're called by the, by the authorities, and uh, African-Americans from the Black Gorilla family, people who are called the worst of the worst. And they thought, well, throw them in there together. They'll be isolated. They won't be able to cause any trouble. And they'll just fight with each other, uh, yeah, you know, because they hate each other. Well, of course, the opposite happened they begin to discuss things with each other and they begin to build community. And especially after this class where, you know, they began where they read the book on Bobby Sands and they read about the ways that community was organized uh, in, in the H-blocks. 
uh, they started saying, you know, we can do that too. We can begin to organize. Yeah. And they, then they began to, to think about hunger strike. And Todd Ashker said, and this is a quote, he said, whenever I mentioned Bobby Sands, things fell quiet. Everybody began to listen. And they began to say, you know, we've been in here. I think they'd been in there at that time for nearly 20 years in those kind of conditions. Huh. But they began to talk about, well, maybe we can actually do something to do this. And they organized again through lawyers and visitors and so on, uh, hunger strikes. Uh, and, you know, the example of what happened in Ohio that I talked about a few minutes ago was also important for them. So they said, you know, if they can do this in Ohio, uh, we can, we can do it too. Now there's again some striking parallels with what happened in Ireland. Again, they had five demands. They had two hunger strikes, uh, 2011, 6,000 prisoners around California were organized by these, you know, prisoners in what they called the short corridor collective in a very small space in total isolation. But through, through visitors, lawyers, and so on, they were able to organize prisoners all over the state of California. Um, the, the first hunger strike ended when the authorities promised reform, but of course it never happened because they didn't get, again, this may sound familiar to you. Sounds very familiar. Yes, Thomas, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, 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 you know, then they, you know, they went back to the book, I think, and they learned that lesson and they said, okay, we, what we've got to do is organize better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have to hunger strike to the end. And, uh, you know, they learned a lot of lessons from, from what happened in the Irish case. So between July and September of 2013, they organized a new hunger strike. They took a, 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 about a year and a half to organize it, to make sure that everything was in place, that all prisoners all across the state of California were, were on board with this. They had five demands again. Uh, you know, the main one was to get out of uh, this situation, to do away with, with long-term solitary isolation. So in July of 2013, 30,000 prisoners went on hunger strike. And this lasted uh, to September. So July, August, and September of 2013, they were on hunger strike, 30,000 prisoners. Uh, they would have gone to the death, but a judge uh, made an order that, it would, that they would be force fed. And again, something you'd, you'd be familiar with. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the force feeding took them off the hunger strike. But by that time, they had won such support in various circles around California, including, you know, some legislators like Tom Hayden, who's been in, Tom came to Ireland and was a big supporter of, yeah. of the Irish struggle and, and yeah. uh, you know, unfortunately re recently died. But um, Tom, Tom gave a Frank Cowell lecture in, in the failure. And he was a major force to take the struggle of the, of the prisoners in Pelican Bay into the California legislature. And they, at the same time, had a, um, uh, had a, a lawsuit, Ashker versus the governor of California. And eventually, the prisoners had a great victory. Uh, in September of 2015, this is two years after the hunger strike, uh, it was very clear to the state of California that they were going to lose, uh, they were going to lose the lawsuit. And so they basically gave in. And this was the beginning of the end of solitary confinement uh, in the United States. So as I said before, there were 90,000 prisoners being kept in these conditions. Today, there's far, far fewer prisoners who are kept in long-term solitary confinement. New York soon followed. New York and California have two of the biggest prison systems in the US. And they did away with solitary confinement as well. So, uh, oh, there they are. That was the, the condition of uh, their exercise. Although they had a ball and they sat out there for an hour just throwing a ball around. These are the guys that were involved in the, the leaders of the uh, prisoner human rights movement. Uh, Todd Ashker is the guy up on the upper right hand, Sitawa Jama, uh, the African-American, uh, Arturo Castellanos, George Franco, um, uh, Antonio uh, are, are the others who were involved in that. But these guys organized this incredible movement from total isolation that, that got 30,000 people involved in this two month hunger strike and won the rights 
and, and it was so much influenced. Um, I just have a, a quote from Todd. He said, a big influence on us was the Bobby Sands book, which combined with everything else going on at the time was what helped to guide our decision to resist and move for reforms via hunger strike protest. He says, it was 1 a.m. and I told Danny, his, his friend, I was fed up thinking of going on hunger strike. He immediately said he was thinking the same thing. And it took off from there. He said, it's as simple as that. The reason it's as simple as that is that we were all situated similarly. And all of us recognized that our prior methods, legal challenge in the courts were not effective and something had to be done to expose and put these people in check and stop their continual abuse of power. So taking the example, not, not just of hunger strike, but of organizing in the way that, that many of the ways that were organized uh, through you know, smuggling and various other things and the things that, that they read about uh, in the Hitch Block campaign uh, was very, very important to them. Yeah, communication. Communication was key, finding a way to communicate, to, to, to get their word out. And also, you know, their, their interactions with supporters, mm -hmm. you know, building support on the outside. So, you know, you, you remember the various things about, you know, smash H block and coming up with simple, um, simple campaign slogans and things like that, which brought this thing to the, to the focus of the public, a public which really didn't know anything about what was going on uh, in Pelican Bay until, until this message began to come out. Uh, and those were lessons, you know, that were very much learned from, from reading about the, the struggle in Ireland. Just very briefly, I'll go through another couple of cases and then maybe we can have a bit of discussion. Um, Julie Ducatel translated the biography into French. Uh, and here's a copy of the, the French version of the biography in 2011. And that biography went around the prisons in France and among Basque and other political prisoners. Uh, two Basque political prisoners held in France, Eitzel Iriondoc and Jorgi Garatagoitia, read the book in uh, Bois d'Arcy prison near Paris. I think I have a picture of that prison near Paris. And just to quote Eitzel uh, for a minute, he says, a, a Corsican political prisoner held in the same jail as us, bought the book, read it and passed it along to us. We really enjoyed it. And another comrade said half joking that we should translate it into Uskara. Our first thought was that it was one of the craziest ideas we ever heard. But after some time we realized that it was actually a very good idea and that it would be important reading for Basque people and especially at least to me, for all our comrades that are locked in Spanish jails. So they started in March, 2012 and finished the translation eight months later in January, 2013. And Eitzel says, there are many stories in this book, the accounts about freedom fighters, the struggle within the jail, the right to speak your own language and language of course comes up again and again and again. Mm -hmm. The work among and for the communities when Bobby was free for those few short months. He says, there are some few books, there are some books that are a lifelong inspiration. This one is definitely part of that category. So like prisoners in Ohio and, and California, Eitzel says, uh, and I quote here, I am fascinated by the way the Irish political prisoners led by Bobby Sands were able to organize themselves under the most strict rules in jail and their capacity to raise and maintain a good spirit there, their capacity too to take autonomous decisions without, without outside interference. And, and they again then have learned many of the lessons and it's helped them in their prison struggle there and both in the French and the Spanish sides of, of the yeah. Basque struggle. And it's been widely read among Basque prisoners, but also in the, in, in the Basque communities. And the last place I'd like to talk about very briefly is, is Turkey and, and also the Kurdish struggle. Turkey, uh, we, we set up a similar course in Turkey where we were corresponding with leftist prisoners in the F-type prisons which many people in Ireland will have heard about, but the F-type yeah. prisons are uh, next to supermaxes in the US, probably the most notorious prisons in the world. And uh, Turkey next to the US has the highest rate of imprisonment in the world. And it's, it's rapidly rising as the uh, authoritarian regime of Erdogan and his, his friends uh, gets worse and worse. 
So we had a course, and and again, we were we, we were corresponding with Kurdish and leftist prisoners around the Eftai prisons in Turkey, and the same kind of thing as we were doing in in uh, in the U.S. Uh, they were reading the same books that the um, that the students were reading. Uh, they read excerpts first, and then they were able to read the full book once it got translated into Turkish. Uh, and you know, many of the same kinds of, of examples were kind of coming out of, of action. It wasn't long before a, a major hunger strike was carried out by the Kurds uh, after you know this was going on. And they always, of course, there were other hunger strikes in Turkish prison history as well. But whenever they talk about hunger strike, they always talk about Bobby Sands. And they always talk about the Irish prisoners. And I think that this had, had a real impact on it. And one little story that I might tell, we, we talked in the class about how um, money was a very good form of um, propaganda because it goes around the place. And, and I mentioned you know, that there was a point in which people were writing hate block on Irish currency and on British currency. And it was being going around, and it was a very, very uh, informative way of getting the word around that there was a thing called H block. And pretty soon, uh, it was being reported in the Turkish media that somebody was writing FTP or F type on Turkish currency, and you know they were even using some of those uh, strategies from the Irish protests. Uh, but okay. you know the the hunger strike then by the Kurds and and really since that time, there have been continual hunger strikes, uh, especially by Kurds and PKK, uh, in Turkish prisons, and they were able to uh, coordinate to get a, a a version of a Kurdish version of the book, which has been widely read both in the prisons but also especially uh, in Rojava, which is the free autonomous region of northern Syria, uh, a region which is kind of organized by the YPG, um, which, which some of you may know about in there. Yeah. And you know what they're trying to do is build a new kind of autonomous regime, which is kind of a, a regime from below, organized really on a lot of the lines that, that Bobby dreamed about when he talked about, you know, how could we organize uh, Irish speaking communities outside of the prison when we go back uh, back into the community. And, and that's very similar to some of the things that, that you know, the Kurdish movement is doing. Uh, and, uh, you know, they've, they've been reading the book. Um, one of the thrills of my life, I guess, was, was someone who I had knew in Turkey said they, that they had a friend who just came back from Rojava. And the YPG uh, fighters who were fighting ISIS were reading about Bobby Sands. They were reading the Bobby Sands book on the front lines, which uh, is really powerful. amazing. Yeah. Very powerful. And then finally, just, you know, this is a very recent thing, ANF News, the uh, Farat News Agency, which is a major Kurdish news agency. Uh, just in May, you know, uh, again, amongst all of their news about, you know, the, the, the struggle uh, in Kurdistan, the struggle in Rojava, and so on. You know, the top story uh, in May was was 40 years ago. Bobby Sands, uh, you know, died on hunger strike. So the struggle continues, but the impact that Bobby has had is something that really continues, and that all of the Irish prisoners had on struggles in other parts of the world really continues to be an amazing thing. And many people today are either free or living in humane conditions uh, because of the example that you know you, Bobby, all the rest of the prisoners said, and of course the nine others who died on hunger strike said, uh, which which really has become a, become a beacon throughout the world and an example, and the idea that people can actually read about how prison struggle can be organized in those very very severe regime regimes that you faced uh, in the hate blocks. Uh, has been, you know, a tremendous, a tremendous thing for prisoners and also for people in struggle throughout the world. And I'll end it there just, you know, with the, with the idea that, you know, this example, you know, continues to be a powerful example and has done incredible things throughout the world. 
Wow. Um, Dennis, what can I say? Um, I feel uh, very humbled, in fact, um, to learn of the impact um, that the uh, people reading about the uh, prison struggle here has had uh, on an international basis. But it's very fitting. It has to be said, it's very fitting, particularly um, in the you know, in Bobby's writings, what comes out very, very strongly is his uh, sense of solidarity with international uh, communities and struggle against, you know, the the different forces of oppression and what, what have you. And it really sort of is exemplified in his poem, the the, the rhythm of time, where he, he calls out some of the, the various uh, struggles, ancient and modern, which have uh, afflicted the, the, um, the, 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 there's a phrase in Irish, and cuswincher, the ordinary working people. You know, I, I think that is, is, is come across uh, very, very strongly here uh, in your talk, and I'm uh, very taken with it. So um, I, I don't know what else to say at the minute. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, in response to that, one of the most powerful things to me you know, the fact that, that two people that I've become closest to are, you know, a white man who's, who's said to be organized in the Aryan Brotherhood and, and an African-American man from, from Cleveland, Ohio, who are supposed to hate each other, but who are best friends. And, you know, I've become probably closer with Bomani Shakur. His, his uh, given name is, is Keith Lamar. And by the way, I just want to mention that, you know, he's still in struggle for his life. He's been given, mm -hmm. a, he's been given an execution date. And uh, I would, would encourage people to go on to the website, um, www, I'm, I'm wearing his t-shirt here of Keith Lamar, www.keithlamar.org. That's K-E-I-T-H-L-A-M-A-R.org. And uh, to find out about the campaign, I mean, he's leading a, cam a campaign to, 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 to save his life, uh, basically. But, you know, the thing that he says, which I think is very powerful and, and which he learned, you know, from you guys was uh, that, that there's things that are more important than living when you're not really living, uh, that solidarity mm -hmm. is important and that it's important to, you know, be willing to sacrifice uh, for for your comrades, and you know that was one thing that that he learned very powerfully. And he says he's not you know he's not going to go down uh, peacefully. You know a lot of, a lot of people you know he he sees them go on to the gurney you know where they're strapped down and injected with uh, various drugs chemicals, uh, but that he's he's not going to go that way. Uh, he's going to fight to the end. And you know uh, the fact that an African-American and a white guy or in California that, um, you know, whites, Latinos yeah. and, and uh, African-Americans come together in that kind of solidarity. They talk about uh, prison race. You know, we, we don't have a white race. We don't have a Latino race. We don't have a black race. We have a prison race. Yeah. And that's the way that they talk about solidarity. And, and you know, the impact of, of the Irish campaign on that I think has been tremendous and it's something that that you know everybody who's been involved in that both inside and outside in Ireland can be very proud of well they're, they're, um, and we've been sort of uh, taking it back with all this but um, I, I just hope that um, we get the that it has the reaction amongst people here. In, in our community, um, particularly amongst the, um, you know, the wider Republican family and all of our friends and the friends of Fela that, uh, that you've had on me here today, Dennis. Um, I'm, I feel very, very humbled by it. Um, and, and well, I think, I think we all feel humbled by, by what you've done, you know. That's uh, that's the other thing. So maybe maybe you know mutual humbling is um, <laughs> is a form of yeah. a form of solidarity. You know, okay. I mean it's it's learning. It's about learning really more than anything else. And you know the fact that that people can 
you know, in the in certain kinds of circumstances, you know, really reach within themselves very deeply within themselves yeah. and do things that, you know, I'm sure you did things you'd never imagined. Absolutely, uh, you could have done, and you know that that creates a great example, and it then gives it, it gives hope to others because you know the a lot of these are prisoners who didn't have hope for 10, 20, 30, even 40 years. Oh. And, you know, after seeing that example and reading about it, it, you know, it gave them not only hope, but a roadmap, mm -hmm. a, a way to think about going forward. Okay. All right, Dennis, um, I think um, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. I'm uh, still a wee bit sort of <laughs> um, taken by all of this. So, um, and, and, and I look forward to uh, having you back in uh, West Belfast for Fela at, at some stage where not only can we develop the, the, um, the discussion and the debate and the lessons and all the rest of it, but also look at some of the futuring of where else we can go with this sort of solidarity and, and the lessons learned from from struggle so thanks yeah when i when i heard from from bill you know or got the invitation i mean i i was threw my hands up in delight you know after this year and a half of covid yeah. saying great you know let's let's get back to belfast yeah and, okay you know, still many of my best friends are are, are there Brilliant. and I miss you all and uh i'm hoping next year by next year you know this covid thing will be done and we can uh get back to normal so so I'm, I'm with you there. Let's have this discussion. Let's see how we can move things forward. And, and thankfully, it won't be by Zoom. Uh, <laughs> no, face no. Face, face <laughs> well. All right. Slan, slan, Kara, Kara, Mavis, yeah. and Chief. Okay, okay. Slan, you slan. too. Thanks, thanks very much. Slan. Slan.